Hi, I'm Eric Shaw, and today we're going to continue our discussion of the Yoga Sutras, and we're going to walk into the text. We're going to take a look at the first three sutras, and what we're going to get there is a sketch of how the conversation is going to unfold throughout the whole entire book. So the first sutra gives us a platform, the second sutra gives us a method, and the third sutra gives us a goal. So we begin with Atta Yoga Nu Shasanam. <laughs> That's the first sutra. And the first word of the sutra is now, Atta, which is, which is nice, yeah? Because we know that the sutra is, is designed to take us into the moment. So if the first word of the whole book is now, that's pretty cool. So, Atta Yoga Nu Shasanam. Um, now complete instructions of yoga, that's usually the way that this is translated, but if we pick apart the words a little bit, we get a little bit of a deeper insight into all of the associations that Patanjali is making with his clever use of Sanskrit. That's the cool thing about Sanskrit, is it gives us opportunities to say a lot of things at once, and that's the quality of any great scripture, in that it um, allows for multiple interpretations, it allows for multiple reflections, it allows for multiple subjective consciousness, individual consciousnesses, to see their own wisdom through it. That's a key feature of Sanskrit in general. It is a translucent language. It is a multivalent language. It is a language in which the words have so many meanings that we can find our own truth in it. Okay. Some authorities would say that Patanjali's instruction is very precise, that there isn't a lot of variation for meaning, but I would, I would contend with that. So, Atta Yoga Nushasanam, Atta now, Yoga Nushasanam, Anu is a word that you might be familiar with, my listeners might be familiar with, if you knew Anusara Yoga, a form of yoga that was uh, taught by John Friend that began in 1997 and pretty much died out in 2012. Uh, Anusara was the name of it, flowing with grace. So we know, we might know that term, Anu, Anushasanam. Anushasanam, Shasanam is related to this word Shastri, or Shastra, which is an authoritative text in the tradition, a scripture. So Patanjali has written something that became a scripture, but here he is referencing the scriptures that precede him. And as in our previous talk, those scriptures would be Vedas, those scriptures would be Upanishads, um, if the Bhagavad Gita had been produced by then, and we pretty much guessed that it was, he might have been referring to that text, or other texts that have died out or that we don't know about, but a larger body of texts that any student of the tradition who was a brahmacharya, who was a young man, usually a young man in, the, in those days, who was interested in studying yoga, in his youth he would be schooled up, usually by his father, the father is often the guru, um, in these traditions, he would re have read these scriptures. So, Atta Yoga Nushasanam, now that you have read the scriptures, now that you are in line with the tradition, now that you have digested the tradition a little bit, you are ready to learn yoga. You are ready to walk through this door with me. It's kind of a precondition that he is setting at the same time. He's stating something as a precondition, as a statement of belief in you the reader, Atta Yoga Nushasanam, now that you are flowing with the scriptures, um, now you are ready to flow, as it were, with my, my scripture. <laughs> now you are ready to flow with my instruction, um, which is guaranteed to have a certain depth, partly by his reference to the other scriptures. He's saying to you, I know the scriptures um, as well as you know the scriptures, and this will be in line with the tradition as we know it. That, of course, is a key meme in the Hindu tradition. It has a great respect for authority. It has a great respect for hierarchy. It has a great respect for lineage. So there is always a bowing to the guru. There is always a bowing to the lineage holders of any tradition before you begin an instruction. Um, and this is sort of take that form of that in Yoga Sutra because there's not a formal uh, recognition of a specific guru by a specific name or even a specific god. So it tells you something about the nature of the text. It is textual. It leans on text. It leans on rationality. It leans on instruction. And this text will be a text of instruction. And that's what makes it 
particularly unique and unique for its time and unique in the tradition. Atta Yoga Nushasanam. Setting, relationship. Next sutra, Yoga Chitta Vritti Narodaha. Yoga, we know yoga. It's saying the method of yoga is the blocking of the mind stuff. It is the corralling of the mind stuff. It is the turning away of the mind stuff, making a line, making a demarcation, making a boundary with the mind stuff. What is the mind stuff? The mind stuff is this. <laughs> yeah. The mind stuff is the flowing waves of consciousness. And it's not that the flowing waves of consciousness are bad. <laughs> we have to have the flowing waves of consciousness. We have to have some way of taking all of this and putting it into pattern. Yeah. That's what virti means. Virti means pattern, roiling, turning, involuting pattern. We have to make a way to make all of this that we see agree with what we already know. That's kind of the habitual activity of the mind, is that it's always making sense. It's always putting things in its place. That is an action that we have to have as beings to survive and thrive, um, living beings on this planet, but it's not the activity of yoga. Yeah. It's definitely not the activity of Patanjali's yoga. When we get to the Tantra tradition, uh, there's a bit more of a compromise around that. But in Patanjali's yoga, it is what we call Sramana tradition. It's the tradition of the extreme yogi. Hmm. Krishnamacharya and others, beginning in the 1930s, uh, Ganganath Jha, his preceptor, his teacher also, have, and it's particularly T.K.B. Deskachar, the son of Krishnacharya, have turned our attention toward the sutra as a householder text, as a text that people like you and me can use, people who have not retreated to the cave. But if we're going to be truthful about the nature of Yoga Sutra, it is a text for the extreme yogi. It's a, it's a text for the virtuoso, someone who has given their complete self to a very extreme practice with very extreme goals because the goals he will describe in that text are so far beyond what most of us could achieve, we know that this text is for someone who is really working hard at the practice. It's not so much for householders, for a yogi, it's for a shramana, a striver. That was, those are two categories of um, two basic demographics of people that we hear described in the Upanishads, which preceded the um, Yoga Sutras. The shramanas, the strivers, the brahmanas, the householders. So this is a text that attempts to block this material reflective ratiocination, this pattern of thought in this world, not because it is bad, but because it's not useful for our purposes. Yeah. Our purposes are to get beyond this. Yeah. Our purposes are get to, to get beyond this horizontal world, this horizontal pattern of thinking, and to get into a vertical pattern of thinking. Yeah. To get into a pattern of thinking that transcends this everyday consciousness. This everyday consciousness has its uses, but yoga is there to teach us how to enfold all of this perception, all of this mentation, the, the quality of manas, the functioning of the mind stuff, in the larger realm of consciousness as consciousness. Yeah. We want to, it's often described in the tradition that we want the consciousness to be a cool, flat pool. Hmm? Those roilings that you see over there, those patterns, that's like the virti. Yeah? If my cameraman can get that, <laughs> he can turn away from me for a moment. I'll walk over there. So these patterns are like the virti. Yeah? This is the metaphor that's often used, that the mind is like a pool, and we are attempting to still the patterns so that it can reflect. And here you can see that this has some capacity of reflection, even though it's dark water, and it's a little bit turbulent, so that it can reflect the sky making consciousness clear and flat, as it were, without virti, yoga chitta virti, without pattern, so that the ultimate consciousness can be reflected in the mind. So that the mind can see ultimate knowledge, not just this knowledge. Yeah. So it gives us this term chitti. Chitti is the mind stuff. It's often translated as mind stuff. But chitti also means mind heart. Yeah. So it doesn't just include manas, it doesn't just include the mental faculty, the mental processing, it also includes what we call buddhi, the, the, the capacity for choice. Yeah? And that choice is said to rest in the heart. And of course modern science is catching up with this knowledge of the yogis, that's what I would suggest. It's learning that there is neural tissue in the heart, that the heart actually thinks. So we have this capacity of choice, we have this 
capacity for the why. Yeah, not just the how, but the why. And chitta involves both of those activities, those, both of those reflective activities. I, I move with intelligence, I organize my reality, but I also know why I move in this reality. So chitta involves those things, but all of that stuff needs to be set aside if we are going to come into the realm of unconditioned consciousness. Unconditioned consciousness is like the sky, it's like space, everything is contained in it. We are given this concept of purusha in the tradition, uninterrupted, unconditioned consciousness. This Samkhya philosophy that lies behind Yoga Sutra gives us these two dualities of Prakriti and Purusha. This is Prakriti, where we're hanging out now. Purusha is the consciousness which um, I am motivated by. Yeah? It is the thing that makes me animate, that makes me alive. It's, it makes everything here tessellate with a living quality. So consciousness enfolds anything, and that's where we want to arrive. Yoga's chitta vritti no rodaha. Yoga's method is to block the flow of the mind in, every, in the everyday patterning that it makes. And for what purpose? The purpose is explained in the following sutra. Tadadra stuhusva rupe vastanam. Then we rest in the our true nature, svarupe, our own nature, our one nature, our oneness nature, we could think of. Tadadrastuhu svarupe vastanam. And to reference uh, the awareness that you might have, especially if you practice in Ashtanga Yoga, we have this term drishti. And drishti means the eye gaze point. And we have that same root in drishtuhu. Drisht, it means to see. So the drishtuhu is the seer the one who sees, or the one who has the identity of the seer. So what Patanjali is steering us towards, is he's steering us towards arriving at witness consciousness. And not just the capacity for witness consciousness, but coming into svarupe around witness consciousness, coming to see your own form as witness consciousness. Seeing your own identity, your ahamkara, as witness consciousness. That's where Patanjali wants to take us. He gives us a setup, a relationship, a ta yoga nushasanam. He gives us a platform on which to work. And then he gives us yoga shutti verti narodaha. He gives us a method. We're going to block the consciousness. And then what are we going to do with that? We're going to arrive at a goal. And the goal is to become the seer, drashtuhu. Yeah? He will frame this in different ways as we move through. He will ultimately give us this idea of kaivalya, complete ind independence of consciousness. But it relates to this idea of the drishtahu in, in the same way. Independence of consciousness comes from dissolving into the all-consciousness. Because yeah? the only thing that can be completely independent is that which encompasses everything. Yeah? Because if, you, if at any time you have mere relativity, it will be conditioned by something outside of it. But if you have pure consciousness, it's conditioned by nothing. Yeah? And that's how it attains kaivalya, complete independence. So this early concept that we get in the Third Sutra is tied to the ultimate concept that we get in the book, Kaivalya, the ultimate goal, that we will move through the Ashtanga Yoga, the eight limbs, eight limb goals of yoga to get to. Tada drashtuhu svarupe vastanam, the goal of the practice. Thanks for listening.